Well, welcome to Antarctica. We made it across the Drake Passage and we've arrived here on Half Moon Island. Beautiful spot in the Shetland Islands and an island full of chinstrap penguins. We've got chinstraps that are molting. Those are the mottled looking ones, black and white. We've got chicks up there with tufts of down feathers on the tops of their heads and on the backs of their necks. Those are the chicks of this year. They're just about seven or eight weeks old. They grow very, very quickly. They're almost the size of the adults. And there are a few adults that have been coming up from the water, very clean and full of krill in their bellies to come up and feed their chicks. So this is one of the sites where I've been doing uh, research for a long, long time. We've actually been counting the number of breeding pairs of chin straps here for several years. The first time was in 1995. And at that time we had about 4,500 pairs of chin straps. It's come down a bit to under 3,000 pairs. We can see that just by counting the number of active nests from year to year and the productivity of the chicks. It's an interesting study site that's been monitored for over 20, 25 years now. And it gives us a little bit of an indication about what's going on here in the Antarctic environment. It seems that increased snowfall may be affecting their breeding sites because down low we used to have quite a bit more activity of the chin straps and now they're just up high on the peaks. So it may be snowfall that's the factor limiting their reproductive success. Come along, please. First row seats available. If you want some information about the area, just to read the landscape a little better, we are in this uh, bay called Anbord Bay, Nico Harbor. Nico is the name given because there was a whaling ship called Nico stationed here in the very early days of Antarctic exploration. The place we're standing on and the place you just walked is one of the few ice-free areas of Antarctica. The whole of Antarctica has only 0.3% of its terra firma exposed. In the peninsula where we are now, that goes 10 times higher. So 3% of the whole peninsula is free of ice, which is still pretty little. And uh, having exposed ground is fundamental for the wildlife. Penguins need to breed, seals have to come out, and then of course we can follow. So all these cliffs of ice are calving, as you see, numerous icebergs all around and they're calving, some of them are more active than others. We already saw some calving today. In this area here, you can see all the brush ice floating around. So do enjoy the scenery, it's a wonderful day.
we are in Charcot Bay in Antarctica on the peninsula. All the birds have come in to see us. They've just gathered around us because we're quiet, leave no trace, and they're curious and they come up to see what we're doing. This is what makes kayaking in Antarctica real special. Although the conditions are windy and it's snowing, we've managed to tuck ourselves in kind of out of the wind and we've been making some fantastic kayak journeys in under the cliffs, in around these icebergs here. And everyone, even people who haven't been kayaking before, have managed to have a fantastic journey. So I'm uh, Captain Bjarne Larsen, I'm Captain on the Seaborn Quest. We are presently on uh, our 20th cruise down to Antarctica, the fifth season. And this is the only, uh, this is the second time that we are crossing the southern uh, polar circle, the Antarctic polar circle, which we achieved this morning uh, around uh, 6.30 in the morning and we managed to to beat our own personal record by being most south uh, for, for any Seaborne ship. Uh, we have 30 years anniversary this uh, year and this is the, only the second uh, time we are crossing the polar circle and the first time we are this far south. We actually changed our plan uh, yesterday just to uh, get south and uh, get the most out of it and uh, to make sure that we all could go home, especially our guests. Uh, with, uh, with a certificate saying that they have been crossing the uh, polar circle down south. To be captain down here is one thing, but you could not do it without uh, a, a crew who is always willing to, to go beyond uh, what is expected. And that's the kind of crew I have on board right now. 
they're always willing to go the extra mile and I like to thank uh, all of my crew and the expedition team. It's the best crew I, I could have down here, so, so simple as that. Welcome to our office. This is an incredible part of the world and being here as a kayak guide offers us an incredible perspective. We are right down on the water, along the shorelines, paddling through brash ice, bergy bits, icebergs, watching penguins porpoise past us in the water, playing with frolicking fur seals and other seal species. We've got glaciers surrounding us. We're listening to Antarctica as she speaks as the glaciers calve off, smashing down into the water. Some days we can have an interesting trip where we actually have to surf gently over the tops of these waves created by the calving glaciers. Fur seals were hunted to near extinction in the early 1800s, mainly around South Georgia, but also here in the South Shetlands. And a few groups gave rise to what's here today. And 95% of the 4 million seals that are out there now breed in South Georgia. But they come down here to the Antarctic Peninsula along the tip, mainly here in the South Shetlands, but a little bit further south also, in the summertime, in the late summer, so right around now. They've only arrived in the last few weeks. They are down here to molt and to take advantage of the rich food source that's down here, all of the krill. 
Not all four million come down here, just a handful, and they'll be here for a few months, and then they head back north. Well, the main mission of UNESCO for World Heritage is to protect the sites that are important for humanity for the future generations. That's our task. We have about a thousand of these sites, a little more than a thousand, and we work with public and private uh, partners to protect the sites and to ensure that the future generation will be able to enjoy them. Well, the partnership with the Seaborn is a, a match between a international intergovernmental institution and a private operator that share, they share the same values, they share the same view, they want to protect the sites for the future. Tourism can be a very important factor in protecting World Heritage Sites because it can bring not only uh, resources that are important for uh, the management of the sites, but also awareness. It's very important that the people of the world are aware that these sites are very fragile. They're very exposed to risks. Tourism that is aware of this risk can be a very, very important help in the effort that we are conducting. <music>